My name is Michael Goldberg, for those who have not met. Um, and it is great to welcome back to his own former class, Mike Belsito. So thanks for doing this. And, and um, just to, uh, as students joined in and folks from the community join in, um, if you wouldn't mind using our chat function, um, and you can see a number of the students are doing this. Um, if you can put your LinkedIn um, uh, profile in there and introduce yourself, that would be awesome and really helpful. Um, we're hoping some networking can take place from this. Um, one of the things that I think we really miss in class is being able to interact with guest speakers and kind of chit chatting beforehand. So feel free. Um, and even if there's, if you want to do any side chatting with anyone um, who looks uh, like somebody you want to connect with, please go ahead and do that in the chat. So, um, oh, there we go. Okay, who are you in? Pro okay, end poll. Sorry, my thing is just polling has gone awry. It's a good idea. Yeah, um, so let me turn it over to Marissa, who is our student moderator today, who will be in discussion with Mike and. She, so please just put your questions in the chat. And um, again, I want to thank Mike for taking the time to do this. And thanks to all of you from the community, from the class who are joining us today. So over to you, Marissa. Thanks, Professor, Professor Goldberg. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, my name is Marissa Muth, and I'm really excited to be moderating the discussion today. And it is my pleasure to introduce Mike Balsito. Mike has spent the last 12 years in the entrepreneurship world, and he is the co-founder of Productive Collective. Additionally, he is an adjunct faculty member at Case Western in the design and innovation department. Uh, so to start it off, Mike, can you take us back and give us an overview of your journey, starting from your experiences at Find, find a Way to a Funeral to where you are today? Yeah, for sure. And, um, and thanks for having me, by the way. This is fun a little different than my last class visit michael um so but i like this it's we're now in the modern modern world here um so yeah i'll, I'll kind of rewind back um really i've been involved in early stage startups my whole career and it's uh, something that i really love now but it's not something that i was necessarily planning for it's not what i thought my career um was going like this isn't the way i thought my career would would sort of roll out right um, but when I went to Bowling Green State University for undergraduate, um, I studied sport management. My goal at that time was to become a Division I college athletics director, and that was, that was all I was focused on at that point. Um, so I had a lot of internships. I had internships in pro sports, college sports, uh, for a sports agency. And um, one of my mentors at the time, um, he, had, he was the athletic director at Bowling Green, and he had recommended that I – if I, if I were to pursue a master's degree right after undergraduate to not pursue a master's in sports business, but instead uh, to pursue an MBA. And in his words, he's like, look, Mike, I don't know if this is what you're going to want to do your whole career. Like this isn't exactly glamorous. And this way, if you were to get a master's degree in business, you know, you, you have a lot more flexibility. Um, and and you really say? you're going to learn, you're not going to learn, you know, too much different from a master's in sports business versus, um, you know, what you learned the last four years. So the short of it is I got to Case West. I went to Case Western for business school. And so um, while I was there, I met the athletics director and decided I would pitch her on the idea of me interning in their corporate sponsorship group. Uh, my last uh, internship was in corporate sponsorships, and I was still interested in that. And so I met her um, right on the front lawn in front of the Veal Center. And I remember her, you know, basically me pitching the idea. And she had said, well, Mike, that would be great. But we don't do corporate sponsorships in the athletics department. You know, we're a division three school. We don't have the money to hire somebody to build that program. And we don't have enough staff to divert people away from what they're already doing and, and build that. So, you know, we don't really do that. And so my first reaction, which was not planned, I did not know that, you know, that this program didn't even exist, but my first reaction was, well, that's okay. You know, let me build it. And you know, I'm an intern. So just pay me whatever, I'm able to raise like a percentage or something, you know, you don't have to even pay me an hourly rate or anything. And what I didn't realize was that was her first day on the job. Like her name was on the website and she actually was already, she was the basketball women's basketball coach at case. Um, but her first day on the job at athletic director was when I was meeting with her. And so there was a little bit of good timing that, you know, maybe she wanted to put her stamp on something right away, but 
she ultimately said yes. And so I created the first corporate sponsorship um, program for the athletics department at Case Western. So this was 2003 to 2005, um, those two years. And, and within like 60 days, by the way, I had signed up a few sponsors. Like I had created what that program could look like, what the inventory would be, and I started selling it. And so I think that first year, I think I generated like $30,000, um, which, you know, at a place like Ohio State would be a drop in the bucket. But at a place like Case, you know, it's like a football coach's salary, right? So it's, it's meaningful. And by the time I finished business school at Case, you know, instead of thinking like, all right, next step, you know, how do I become an athletics director? In my mind, I'm like, yeah, sports. I mean, I do still love sports, still passionate about it. But, you know, man, I wish there was a career out there where you could sort of you know, come up with an idea, create something and, you know, keep doing that. And then it dawned on me, like, that's what entrepreneurs do. That's what entrepreneurs have been doing forever. So it was right at that point in time where I decided maybe I'll get involved in sports at some point, but that's not, that wasn't the most important thing for me. I wanted to figure out what it meant to be an entrepreneur and, and really learn um, what it would take to be an entrepreneur. And so I came into contact with a couple people that were starting this company called Findaway. And they were looking for somebody to join their team as the first hired employee. So, you know, there was a few people that had started it, but they were just starting getting ready to actually hire people. And um, they offered me a job there right out of business school. And I took it. And I remember getting to work on the very first day, my business cards were there. And literally the title on the business card was find a wear. So, you know, the company was find a way. My title was just find a wear. I was just sort of um, doing whatever it took um, in those early stages. And you wear so many hats in those early stages of the business. And, um, but, but it ended up that I sort of took on more customer facing roles at find a way. Um, I ended up creating pilot programs for, you know, and I, I should say at find a way, we created these digital audio books called play away. Play away is a preloaded, uh, little, looks like a shrunken down little book, but it has an audio jack that you plug headphones in. So this was pre-streaming, you know, iPhones, you know, smartphones, these did not exist, but um, iPods were out there, but like not everybody had one. And so in those early stages, you know, our big clients were like Borders and Barnes and Noble, like these would sell at retail. That was what the whole business plan was built on was selling at retail. Um, but part of my directive was like, hey, Mike, see, you know, see if you could drum up business anywhere else. See if you could, uh, you know, figure out if anywhere else, you know, they, they might have a use for these things. So I started some pilot programs, um, in particular in public libraries and schools where they would buy them and then recirculate them. So I had to come up with, well, what would that packaging look like? Like, what would, how could we service those types of customers? It would be a lot different than the customers that were buying and reselling. And the short of it is after two years, that became the primary business. You know, we stepped out of retail altogether. Retail is really hard. You know, margins are really low. Um, the way it works with retailers is if they buy something and they don't sell it, they can send it right back to you. So it's almost like it's on consignment. Um, but libraries were willing to pay more and they had a need for more and more content because an audiobook on CD, at least at that time, was the number two circulated item in a library aside from a DVD. It wasn't even a book. Um, so that part of the business took off. And after five, six years, you know, we were oh, over a hundred employees. You know, I, I think it was close to a $30 million company at that point, just in terms of revenue. So for me, it was this amazing opportunity to have a front row seat um, and more than a front row seat, like be a part of uh, a high growth startup. You know, in those first few years, it was high growth, you know, going from nothing to, you know, tens of millions of dollars in revenue and, and you know, over a hundred employees. But what happened is in thinking back, it would have been, I guess, the end of 2010, um, something happened where my cousin died and it was just a sudden death, totally unexpected. It was not, uh, you know, he's a younger guy in his 40s. So, you know, younger in the sense of it's not like he was, he died of old age, right? It was, but it was a sudden death that wasn't planned. And, you know, my family was put in a position that a lot of families are put in where you have to figure it out right away. You know, you're dealing with the loss of a loved one, but, but you have to now call a funeral home. Like immediately a funeral home has to come and, and, and pick up the body, you know, and, and all of a sudden now you're working with this funeral home. I'm planning a funeral, but we didn't know which funeral home's better than the other. You know, where my cousin lived, there's six funeral homes within two miles. Um, the, the cost difference of these funeral homes is, you know, one could be $6,000, another could be $15,000 for a full burial service. Yet, 
I learned this later on, cost and quality, there's not necessarily a correlation. But I remember my dad asking me like, hey, Mike, I don't like, is there anything online that can help us? And I just sort of assumed like, well, yeah, of course there is. And I'll figure it out. Like, the, I'll look into it. Don't worry about it. Um, but then I realized that there wasn't. And in fact, many of these funeral homes didn't even have websites. But to actually figure out like, what is the cost? What is this going to cost us as a family? Most of those funeral homes are saying, well, you know, come in, come into the funeral home and we'll talk it all through. But that, which that's great, but you can't, I mean, if, if we're trying to consider six different funeral homes, I don't want six different meetings. I can't, do, you know, why my family wasn't going to do that. So ultimately we ended up just picking one and hoping for the best. And, um, and the service was fine, but I just remember being at dinner with my wife after that service took place. And the only reason we were at that restaurant was because of reviews I read for it on Yelp. And I'm like, no, this is pretty messed up. Like my family just spent whatever we spent, probably $10,000 on my cousin's funeral with very little information on deciding which funeral service provider to pick. Yet we just spent $50 at dinner and I had more information. I was able to instantly pick up my phone and find reviews um, that, that we could use. So, um, so what we ended up doing was, you know, afterwards, um, trying to figure out, okay, what is there more to this? Um, by the way, I know I, I, my video might have cut out. Can you all hear me okay still? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, you. good. Great. So instantly, I start thinking about this. You know, what, why is it like this? Like, what, why is it that people, for not just an expensive purchase, but maybe the most important family purchase they have to make, why, why in some cases, you know, unless you have a family friend in the business, why do you have to just pick one? And I started talking about this with my friend, Brian, who I was working with, who at this point at, at Findaway, Brian and I were tasked with leading the product innovation division. We were, we were trying to come up with new products and services that we could offer to our customers. Brian on the tech side, me more on the business side. And, it, and Brian, for Brian too, he was like, why is it like that? And so we started learning more about the funeral industry um, or the death care industry, you know, as it's really called. And um, ultimately, what we decided to do was try to come up with a solution for this big problem. We didn't necessarily know what that solution would be, but we knew that this is a big problem and it felt like a problem that was big enough for us to really do something about it. And so we found out about a program called the 10 Accelerator, and it was actually the state of Ohio's first um, kind of pilot program it, which uh, for a program that now funds a lot of the accelerators that are in Ohio. And we got into the 10 accelerator. This is summer of 2011. And Brian and I decided to quit our jobs and pursue that full time. And so we ended up raising money from um, a lot of angel investors, um, one venture capital investor. I think I saw one of my investors also in this chat. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, but you know, we, we decided to give this our all. And so f from 2011 to 2014, we built eFuneral as a potential solution to this big problem. And, and eFuneral, our whole mission was to bring transparency to funeral planning. That's what we were aiming to do. We wanted families that were in that position that I was in to be armed with information so that they can make a more informed end of life choice quickly. And so what that meant, at least in the first iteration of eFuneral was, families would submit an inquiry to what they were looking for online and instantly get in, uh, quotes from area funeral homes. And people could review those quotes, review um, reviews that other families have left online as well. And then they could make a decision based on whatever works for them. And so um, the short story with eFuneral is that we didn't, we could never really find, you know, true product market fit. We could never really um, ultimately get to the right solution. And we pivoted, you know, multiple times throughout the course of those, you know, three years. Um, and by the end, of, so by 2014, we knew that we were either going to have to raise more money um, or, you know, figure out another way, a soft landing, just shut down the business. Um, and it was a weird time because I knew that this was a problem that was meaningful. I knew that this is a problem that should be solved. Um, but at the same time, like we weren't, I, we weren't at the point where I could say, you know what, we haven't quite cracked it, but I have early data that shows this next pivot would be the one. If we were at that point, I, we would have tried to raise more money, but I no longer felt that confidence that we were on that track. So um, we ended up technically selling the business. Um, in fact, the funeral technically still exists today, but I always call it a fail sale. You know, this wasn't the kind of acquisition that 
um, you know, we, I was putting out a press release about or celebrating in, in any way. I mean, to me, it was a failure um, and, you know, kind of acquisition. I needed to go find a job afterwards. Right. But it was at least we were able to kind of find a landing spot for some of what we built. Um, and that company that acquired it, they still are operating it today, um, actually, just in a much different, much different way than we were. Um, and then so post the funeral, you know, I was trying to figure out what my next step was. And um, ultimately, I got recruited to be a director of product strategy at a at a sports ticketing technology company. So I guess sports came back into my career a little bit. Um, but I remember when I was recruited, I said, well, I, I, this sounds cool, but I don't know if this is the right fit for me. Like I never went to school for product management. And they said, oh, no, Mike, nobody went to school for product management. You'll be fine. Um, but in my mind, I'm like, yeah, but what, what happens when they figure out I don't know what I'm doing? And so I was reading books, um, blogs, listening to podcasts, trying to figure out what it meant to be a product person. And right at the same time, um, I spoke at a local tech event in Cleveland, um, like a broad tech conference, I'd say. Uh, but I was familiar with the organizer of it, and, and he asked me for lunch afterwards um, as a speaker and a you know friendly acquaintance. And I said, you know, I, th I thought it was awesome. Like people turned up, seemed to have a good time. But there's a lot of these, you know, local tech events where it seems like, you know, same people are on stage, the same people are in the audience. I'm like, you know what you ought to do? I'm trying to figure out what it means to be a product person. And there's a lot of people out there like me. What if you made a conference for product people, focused it in within tech? And I said, maybe people from, you know, Columbus would come. Maybe people from Cincinnati would come. Like, I'm thinking, like, a couple hours driving distance radius, right? And he said, wait, you seem passionate about this. What if we did it together? And, um, and that person's Paul McAvinci. And that conference, uh, what we were talking about, that's what ultimately became industry. Um, industry, the product conference is what we, were, we, we call it now. And... Um, that was 2015. In 2015, we put on that first conference, still with full-time jobs. Um, but it, even though that first year we had maybe 200 people come, but they came from 21 states and seven countries, and that was that like blew our mind because we had no marketing budget. We had like we just bootstrapped this all completely, like just with our own, you know, few bucks in our pocket kind of a thing. And I'm like, you know what? What could this have been? if we were focusing on this full time? What could this have been if like we really were able to like fully promote this? And so what we decided was um, we would create a community uh, for product managers. And that's what we did with Product Collective, which is that's my company now. And we call Product Collective a community because aside from the conference, which now, you know, we've done five editions every fall in Cleveland, um, the last one had 1,200 people. Um, Common was one of our keynotes, which was, which was really fun. Um, we also have a European conference in the springtime in, in Dublin, Ireland. We just had our third industry Europe. But aside from those conferences, we have 30,000 product managers that either get our newsletter every week or attend our live video Q&A chats, which we do twice a month, um, or are in our Slack channel every, idea, every day trading ideas and best practices. And um, you know, that as from a business standpoint, we make our money through the conference, really, you know, through ticket sales and sponsorship. Um, but we're able to help people that were in my exact position, you know, just a few years back, who are all, you know, asking the question, you know, am I doing this right? And so that we're really excited to be doing that with Product Collective now. And yeah, so it kind of brings brings us to today. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, so before I like jump into questions from the audience, it's pretty hard to ignore the current environment that we were in with the coronavirus. So I didn't know if you could talk about how it's impacted your business, Productive Collective, especially when your business is focused on bringing people together. Yeah, well, so you should know, like our European conference was exactly two weeks ago. It ended exactly, like two weeks ago from right this moment, I was on a plane coming back from Ireland. And we just barely got that conference off. The day that we were flying back, Ireland banned events. So we were the last conference in all of Ireland. Um, and, you know, the few weeks leading up to it, you know, we, were, we definitely knew that there could be an issue. Um, but things have just moved so fast. Like it was really only like a week before the conference, the number of attendees who had contacted us to say, oh, sorry, we can't make it it was no different than the year before or, or any other year, but it was all the last two to three days before the conference, people started dropping out because of travel bans or just, you know, just concern. And um, we, we were, 
I mean, it was a really difficult time leading up to it because we wanted to do the right thing. We were following recommendations from our government, but also uh, the government in Ireland. And, um, you know, all throughout the government in Ireland was telling us like, no, it's okay to have gatherings. Like we're not recommending any change to that, um, you know, until, until they didn't. I mean, it literally went from there's no recommendations against it to no events with mo like over 10 people, right? And so, I mean, when we got to that, basically when we were in Ireland, we weren't sure if we were even gonna be able to put the conference on, but we can also start seeing way far ahead. You know, like for where we're at right now, this is a very scary time as a conference organizer. Like I normally, we, so we sell our tickets, like there's already been a couple hundred attendees that have registered for a conference in September in Cleveland. And every month we sell tickets for that. So, you know, when we rely on that revenue for, you know, basically to fuel our business, right? Um, I can say right now with certainty, we're not, you know, we were planning for a 1400 person conference. That was the trajectory we were on. We're not going to have 1400 people this year. I don't even know what the world will look like in September. I don't even know if we're going to be allowed to have an event in September, if that will be the right thing to do. So, um, you know, what that's meant for us is very quickly figuring out, well, it, let's say we can't have an event this year. What does that mean? Um, what else can we be doing as a business? Um, so in a span of 10 days from having that realization that like, hey, this, is, this could come and hit us big time to now, um, we actually just launched um, industry virtual workshops. So that, you know, we put on workshops at the conference. We also do workshops in standalone cities. We actually had one scheduled for early April in New York City. We converted that to a virtual workshop, and um, and then we started working with all of our facilitators that we worked with in the past to say, hey, do you have interest in offering these workshops virtually, and you do, do you want to do it with us? And for them, they, they were really motivated because, you know, they a lot of these people, the way that they make their money is through coaching product teams in person or facilitating in-person workshops or speaking at events. And so this is, um, the reaction's been, we, we announced it two days ago, and the reaction's been awesome. We've already sold the first two out. Um, and so we want to keep doing more and more of these. Um, they actually, the first two don't take place until early April, but then we have more workshops going on in April and May. And um, so I, on one hand, this has affected us by forcing us to innovate and forcing us to really find a way to, to survive the current situation. On another hand, it still brings a whole lot of uncertainty. I mean, I'm a big believer in live in-person events and the value of them and you know, I see the way that our sponsors, for instance, you know, they, they get a lot of business when, when they come and sponsor at industry. And, you know, it, you could, we could put on a virtual conference and maybe we will do that. And that could be cool, but that, you know, you can't spend a lot of time with sponsors during that. Like, like there's all these things that you can't do that you could do in person. So um, yeah, this whole situation is like, we're in the throes of everything now trying to really reinvent our business. And um, there's still a lot of questions that are unanswered too. Great. Yeah, definitely sounds like a lot. So um, we were getting a lot of questions about the accelerator program that you went through. Um, okay. Just yeah. to kind of some background for everyone, all of the case students in our entrepreneurial design class, we were given a case study about Mike and it was about um, before launching eFuneral, him and his partner, they went through an accelerator program. So I'm going to ask you a question from Anthony Durasco. He's a third year finance and economics student. Um, he says, can you tell us more about your experience at the accelerator program? What were the advantages of the program and did it have a lasting impact on the business? Yeah, so this program was called the 10 accelerator and it, um, it was the first accelerator. Oh, I shouldn't say it was the first accelerator in Ohio. I think the brandery might have been, but it was the first state sponsored accelerator. So there was a lot of excitement um, with angel investors and it's just sort of like mentors within the entrepreneurial community period right um but it took place in columbus ohio and so this was the i we we i remember actually we applied on easter of 2011 so basically nine years ago at this point and so you have to keep in mind back then the landscape of accelerators was really small a lot smaller than today anyway like why combinator existed and i was familiar with it but like it wasn't the behemoth it is right. And like Y Combinator back then, I think was still at a point where it's like 10 companies per class. And there's like a winter class and a summer class. Now there's like hundreds in every batch. Um, so things like Techstars did exist, but the, what was unique about 10 Accelerator was two things. One, 
because it was the first time in Ohio um, and it was this pilot program, there's a lot of excitement behind it. So for us, we were like, well, this could, this could, you know, we know that a lot of times you raise money from local angel investors, and this could build a lot of connections with those types of investors. Um, although it turns out that uh, there were people that weren't just from Ohio that were, you know, like paying attention to 10 accelerator too. We met some of our investors that weren't from Ohio through 10 accelerator. Um, but the other big thing was it would, instead of um, it taking any equity, it was giving us the $20,000 or $25,000 or whatever it was as a grant. Um, and that, I mean, I wouldn't say that that was like the most important factor, but like that's another factor. Um, another factor that was important to us was that fact that we were both married. We didn't have kids yet, but you know, we, we, you know, it's like, would we have gone to California for an entire summer? Maybe, but you know, the fact that we could come back on the weekends and cut the grass and, you know, see our wives and like, like that was appealing too. you know, that, that we still, cause we're both, you know, we were both really family oriented. And, um, so all of those factors sort of led us to, um, you know, once we had that opportunity to join 10 accelerator, you know, we took it and, you know, did it help us? I was, it helped us, although I, like it helped us in a few ways, right? So first of all, it put people in our lives that are still in our lives now. Like a couple of my mentors are people that I met through 10 Accelerator and I'm still close with them now. Um, it, we were able to connect with investors that we weren't otherwise connected to. So it did help us raise capital you know, from, uh, from certain investors. I think the other thing that, and this isn't necessarily specific to 10X, it's just the accelerator experience is it forced us to go like all in and deep. Like the fact that Brian and I moved to Columbus to be a part of this, we lived with each other. Um, actually, in my, like he's still my closest mentor. He has a, he had a guest house um, and we li both lived in that guest house. And so we would, you know, wake up, go to, go to the office that they gave us to work out of. And then we'd go back home and, you know, eat dinner, like maybe go on a run. And then we'd be working, you know, again, till midnight. Um, but it didn't feel like for us, it was, it was just an amazing experience to sort of go all in on something for three months and go really deep. Um, and so I think all of those things were sort of the, the bonus points that we got out of being a part of 10X. Great. Thank you. Um, and for everyone to just keep, keep asking questions in the chat, don't hesitate. Um, there's also a lot of questions about eFuneral from a lot of the students, so I didn't know if we could take it there. Um, yeah. There's one from Andy, who's a fifth year chemical engineer from St. Louis. His question is, did you have any difficulty with convincing people to leave reviews since people don't like to talk about death and related subjects? Yeah, I mean, it, it, Andy brings up a good point because death and dying, end of life, these are topics that are considered taboo in a lot of times in our society. And so part of what we were trying to do is get people more comfortable talking about end of life. Um, one of the things that we did do that I am really proud of is like by the end of our time with eFuneral, we created the most comprehensive set of online resources related to end of life. And so um, those, I know it helped a lot of people because like we had a lot of hospice organizations that would share those resources with families. Um, but yeah, getting people to talk about it or think about it is difficult. Um, we still had people that were will. I mean, I would say that the people that use the funeral though, they, at, to leave a review is a little different than like me going up to your face with a camera and saying like, talk about the experience. Like I, I think it, it gives you more of a, um, chance to sort of like, I got to take in your own thoughts. And then when you're ready, you can leave this review and people were actually willing to do that. Where we really struggled was, first of all, on the funeral home side, getting pe getting funeral home owners to accept that the, the internet was relevant in their in their world. Um, again, many did not even have websites, um, so our platform was like the first time that a lot of these funeral homes were even sort of like coming online. Um, th the biggest part, also biggest challenge, also is just when a family is going through that. Um, or just thinking about planning a funeral for us to be top of mind, you know, like the, the fact is we didn't have a massive marketing budget or anything like that. So we had, we had weight, you no, know, those partnerships with hospice organizations, that's one way we were trying to be, you know, available to families when they're in that mindset. Uh, but, but just even like awareness, that's probably one of our biggest challenges. Um, so those are some challenges, I think, but yeah, I mean, 
Andy's right. Like talking about death and dying, it's still a difficult subject in our society. Thanks. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about in the case study, one of the last questions we were asked to give our opinion on was to examine the advantages and disadvantages of outside capital. And I didn't know if you could touch on that, sharing your view on this. Sure. I mean, I think there are definitely, so, you know, eFuneral is a business where we took money from investors, right? So we had investors to work with um, and we had really good investors. Um, product collective, totally different. You know, we bootstrapped it. Um, we've never taken a dollar from an investor with, with product collective. We funded it through our own money, but then customer dollars. Um, I, the advantage of working with investors is that, you know, that capital, if it's there for your company, like that is money can be the lifeblood of a business, right? Like if you, if you don't have money, I mean, it is the lifeblood of a business. You need it, right? So for a lot of businesses, they are the type of business that you might not generate revenue for a very long time. And so the, working with investors, taking outside capital, it, it gives you even a chance that you might not have had otherwise. Um, the other benefit of taking outside capital is depending on who you're taking it from, you now have smart people to turn to who are very motivated to help you. We had some awesome investors where, you know, we ran through challenges. Um, you know, we, we had this investor blog. So basically it was like a private blog that we would post to, to share um, if there was like something really good or, or like a big challenge we were running up against. And so um, if I felt like it was important enough to share, I'd post it there and then it would generate an email to all of our investors too. And we had a lot of investors that they would see that like a big challenge that we're facing. And then they would email me right away and they'd be like, Hey, I was in a situation like this before. Here's what we did. Or just call me and be like, let's talk it through, you know? And so you have smart people that, um, you know, like right now I have smart people I could turn to I have mentors. Right. But like when you have a lot of other smart people and, and they're motivated to help you, um, that's a really good thing too. Um, disadvantages. I mean, there could be disadvantages just in the sense of r when you are raising capital, it's a lot of work. Um, and so, you know, I remember there's a period of time where more than 50% of my time was spent on raising money. And so what that means is that that means less than 50% of my time is spent on, you know, figuring out if we have a business. Um, so that's a, that, that can be a big, big challenge, figuring out that balance. Um, so that's one disadvantage. I suppose another disadvantage can be, and this gets really technical, but like you just have to also be smart about the type of investors that you're bringing on board and, and, you know, make sure that your, your motivations are aligned with their motivations too. Um, we, again, I, we never had that problem. We always had great investors and they were always willing to work with us. Um, I have had, you know, some friends that have raised money where, you know, they find an investor that maybe they're, they're not as aligned um, and there could be challenges there too. So it's just something to be, it, anytime that you're taking money from anybody else, you just have to be conscious of what, you know, who it is that you're taking money of. And you just ask yourself, like, do I want to be working with this person? Um, I think that's a, just an important thing that everybody should be asking themselves before they take outside capital. Thanks for your input. Um, I've been getting a lot of questions about Product Collective and conferencing, so I didn't know if we could go there. So this is from Roslyn. Sure. Her question is, what is the hardest part of hosting a conference? Have these challenges shifted as the conference has grown? Yeah, I mean, so for us, like I, whenever we plan industry, like I'm thinking of three different, I guess, stakeholders you would think of it, but it's like three experiences, which is the speaker experience, the attendee experience, and the sponsor experience. Because all of those groups are so important to us. Um, on the speaker side, like this is who people are coming to learn from. Um, the sponsor side, like sponsors fund, you know, about a third of our business, you know, the rest is ticket sales. Um, and then attendees, right? Like the attendees, that's two thirds of our, our business. And, and we want to create not just customers that are coming one time, like we want fans and we want people to, you know, be coming back year after year. So I, our biggest challenge with uh, industry, it always is getting the word out, honestly, like awareness is still like, I think if I had a hundred product managers in a room and I asked how many of you have heard of product collective, you know, raise your hand, it's still maybe not even half of them know even know about product collective. So awareness is a big deal. Um, 
planning a conference though, like this is, a, this now it's more about like the business side of it. Planning a conference, like we're, it's almost like you want, it's not just about like putting on a, a, an event, like you want to put up, well, for us, we want to put on something special. We want to wow people. We want to surprise people and delight them. So another big challenge is just coming up with every year, like what can be the new delighter this year? Um, as an example, a couple of years ago, we realized, um, and we did this through like attendee calls that we had with, with attendees. Like we realized one of the big challenges for people that are coming is that, you know, their company pays for them to come, they're flying them out to come. There's, there's a lot of uh, stress on them to show that this was all worth it. And a lot of people, you know, you're taking notes feverishly and you end up sharing that with your team. And so in our mind, we're like, how can we take that stress off of people? So at our European event uh, a couple of years back on stage, I remember saying to people, and hey, I know I could already see a lot of you are, you know, have your, your mole skins out, you're taking notes to your laptops. I want to let you know, we actually hired a professional journalist and I pointed them out and I said, they will be taking notes on every single talk. And the, the day after you leave this conference, you're going to get a really nicely put together ebook with all the notes from every talk. The, when I said that, like laptops started closing, like that, that journalist got a bigger ovation than any of our speakers that year. Um, like that was an awesome delighter, but it's not necessarily easy to figure out what those delighters can be and if they're going to go over so well. So that's another big challenge for us too. Um, now we have a whole host of challenges that are, you know, just within these last two weeks that have brought us that are unique that we're still figuring out. But every year, um, yeah, awareness and then how can we give people an experience that was even better than last year? Those are the things we're always wondering. Great, thanks. All right, so I have a follow-up question from that. Yeah. This is from Eric Pomper. He's a senior psychology major at Case. So he says that one of the concepts that we discuss frequently in class is connecting with others and building our networks. So he was wondering if you could talk about how you go about building connections and choosing speakers for your conferences. Yeah, well, I'll give the, I'll answer them both kind of differently. So like building connections, cause this is something you could be doing right now, like building connections with people. And, um, you know, I always look at building connections as no different, honestly, than like dating in a way. Like, and what I mean by that is like, sometimes people ask like, how do I find a mentor? And it's like, well, you find a mentor, like it depends. You don't just go up to anybody randomly and say, will you be my mentor? Um, you know, you, you find out like, who can I build a connection with? Who can I build this real personal relationship with? And is there a connection, right? And so like finding like the mentors I have in my life, I've never said, will you be my mentor? It's people that I've maybe had at first, it just starts with a coffee or something like that. And, um, or now, you know, we live in a world that like that first interaction could be here on Zoom or um, Facebook or Instagram, whatever it might be. But like, it's finding people that, that you have that connection with. And um, and so I think like when I think of finding mentors, it's, it's really much more organic and it's not, it's being like unafraid to like ask people, Hey, like, Hey, are you willing to maybe not grab coffee these, you know, these days, but like, are you willing to like catch up real quick? Or, um, so that's one thing for our conference. I mean, we've found speakers in a lot of different ways before I'm one of my favorite people that I look up to in the business world is Jason Fried. He's the CEO of Basecamp. Um, I've always been a, just a big fan of Jason Fried, like for as long as I can remember. And Jason has now been a speaker at industry multiple times. He's actually giving a half day workshop at industry this fall. He's coming back. It's almost like he's treated industry as a residency now, which he doesn't do that with any other conferences where he's like wanting to come back year after year. The first time that Jason spoke at industry, it was because of a, a Twitter bet that I made with him on the World Series. Um, it was the Indians and Cubs were in the World Series. He's in Chicago. And so it was the morning of game one. And I just reached out on Twitter randomly and said, hey, you know, if, if the, you know I have a bet with you. You know, if the Indians beat the Cubs in the World Series, are you, uh, you know, would you speak at industry? And he responded back and said, what are the dates? And then I, I respond back, but he didn't say anything after that. And I'm like, oh, well, then the Indians go up three nothing in that World Series. So. I feel confident. I, I send a message out to him and I said, Hey, anything can happen, but like, is our bet still on? Cause you know, the Indians are th up three, nothing. Didn't hear anything. Well, and then all of, you know, probably if you live in Cleveland, Cubs won the next four games and beat the Indians in the world series. 
And out of nowhere, I got a message back from Jason that said, well, I won the bet, but I'm still up for it. And so Jason came and spoke at the conference that year. And, um, and I think like we've connected because we're a bootstrap business. They're, they bootstrap base camp. We're in the Midwest. They're in the Midwest in Chicago. And, um, and yeah, he's just kind of taken a liking to what we're doing. Other speakers. I mean, I like w- w- a lot of times what I've done is also create personalized videos. I like, I'll literally create a video, put it up, put it on YouTube, but not, um, promote it on YouTube just as an unlisted URL. And then I'll, I'll cold email them and say, and just basically say, Hey, I, you know, I co-organizer of industry, you know, we bootstrap this, you know, ourselves since 2015, we think you'd be perfect, but I want you to hear about it in my own words. And that video is just specifically for them. I'm referring to them by name. And obviously that takes a lot longer than just sending an email. Um, but uh, we, I like the idea of being really personal about it and doing something that I know, you know, nine out of other 10 conference organizers aren't doing. And it doesn't work all the time, right? Like probably most of the time I'll do that and, you know, go through all that trouble and I don't even get a response. But there's other times, a lot of other times where these people might have just filed my email away normally, but instead they said, you know what? I only speak at one or two conferences a year, but I'm up for it. And that was that way with Ken Norton, who's the head product partner at Google Ventures. Um, this year, Sahil Lavinia, like he's the CEO of Gumroad. That was a cold email, but a, you know, like a really personalized kind of a thing. So, it we find speakers and um, and we do have a call for speakers, by the way. Like I'll say, every year now, now I'll get 250 responses to our call for speakers, and it's always a really good idea to do that because there are speakers that we've put on at industry that I had no idea about, but responded to our call for speakers. And the more that we looked into it, the more I realized, like, this, this person's a perfect fit for industry. So it's a lot of different ways, but hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Um, I have another question about conferencing, and this is from Shavika. And she said, I was wondering how entrepreneurship is viewed different abroad and whether you notice a lot of differences in products launched depending on where a person comes from. Yeah, well... I, you know, look, I haven't been everywhere in the world, so it's it's hard. I mean, even though there's people from all over the world that are part of Product Collective, most of the people that are in Product Collective aren't even necessarily entrepreneurs. They're launching products for companies. Um, I did have time. I did have a chance to spend um, time with entrepreneurs in Zimbabwe and in Zambia um, through actually a program that Michael Goldberg is very familiar with. He's the one that recommended me for it. Um, but it's a program that brings entrepreneurs from America to those countries. And it's, there are specific programs within those countries that um, are, you know, entrepreneurs are building these businesses. And I, this, I don't want to like speak as a whole, but I, from my experiences, like I really related to the people that I worked with there because a lot of the businesses that were created were like mission driven businesses. Like I'll tell you what I didn't hear out there. I didn't hear um, any businesses that they were saying, well, you know, let's, we're creating this business because we see this like big opportunity money wise. And like, that's the real, that's the primary reason we're going after it. Or, you know, this market's hot right now. So we're trying to get in on that. It was like, they were, there were real problems that they were trying to solve. And usually those problems were like problems that affect everyday life. Like not, not like we're trying to build this, you know, widget for your, for some piece of software. Um, It is like life problems that people were trying to solve there. And so I related to them a lot because I, I like for e-funeral, like that's kind of that we considered ourselves to be a mission driven business. Um, so I don't know that I can say that that's true, like for, for every other, you know, country outside of the United States or, or and I'm not saying that U S entrepreneurs aren't that way too, but I do have a special place in my heart for mission driven businesses for sure. Great. Thank you. Um, there's another question about, kind of locations. Uh, Mitch, who's a senior management major, um, asks, how did Product Collective decide on Dublin for the second location for industry? And he says, obviously, Google, Facebook has their European headquarters there, but it looks like industry is geared towards businesses smaller than the Googles and Facebooks. Yeah, so actually, and, and I'll also say like, some people, by the way, thought we were crazy to put a conference on in Cleveland, you know, for software product managers, right? So I, a lot of times in, in the very beginning of industry, I had a lot of people tell me like, oh, that's cool that you could do this. But like, 
nobody's going to fly to Cleveland for this. Like, or, or if you want to do it in the Midwest, like maybe do it in Chicago. Um, but I had, you know, one of a, a person I'll consider a mentor now, Joe Polizzi, he put on a conference called content marketing world, created it from scratch. Um, basically you could think of it as industry, but for, instead of for product managers, it's for content marketers and, um, you know, started as a few hundred people. He grew that to 3,500 people. Um, probably even more than that now. And he sold that conference for a lot of money too, by the way. So like Joe proved that you can build a thriving annual tech conference in Cleveland. Um, I don't know, Emery. I don't know where Edison is. Sorry. This is the work at home and homeschool life now. Um, but the, so Joe, by the way, like he showed us his playbook, you know, metaphorically speaking. And is like, look, for people that are telling you that, how many of them have built a conference before? And it was true. None of them had, right? So Joe gave us that confidence that we could do that in Cleveland. Dublin, you know, as the, I forget who asked the question, but he, that person pointed out a lot of the, um, those multinational companies, European headquarters are in Dublin. So places like, you know, Apple, Google, Airbnb. Um, and actually if our conference, the number one death, like if you look at the number of employees of a company that people are coming from, it's actually more for mid-sized to larger organizations. Like we actually don't, it's not really a startup conference. It's, it is m much more geared towards people at a staff, their product people at established companies. So that's a part of it. I, you know, we knew we wanted to expand to Europe. So then it was a matter of choosing which European city. Um, that aspect helped us with Dublin. Another was just, there's another product conference where their headquarters is in London. And it's not, and it's not like they own London or anything. We just kind of liked the idea of being in a place that didn't already have a big product conference that was happening. Um, and my partner, Paul, is from Ireland. So it, it, that was sort of like a, a nice to have kind of thing. Like he knows the lay of the land. He has some, he has really good familiarity. We do like the fact that it's predominantly English or it is English speaking, although, you know, every European country is English speaking um, anyway, basically. But so it's like all those factors put together, you know, within Europe, it's also really easy to get in and out of Dublin. So all those factors together kind of led us to Dublin. Great. Thank you. Um, kind of like one more question about uh, product collective. This is from sure. Max Pennington. He's a sophomore chemical engineer. And he was wondering if you ever considered doing a product management competition event during one of your weekend seminars. Why or why not? Ah, so yeah, almost like a hackathon kind of a thing, maybe. Um, yeah, yeah, so I will say, like, the people that are product managers usually actually aren't the ones creating product. You know, these are the people that it's not really the developers and designers that are coming to industry. It are the, it, the product manager is the person that is working with the designer and developer and, and like, create, helping create this product roadmap, you know, by working with the management team and so uh, it's funny because a lot of times, you know, people say like product managers have all of the responsibility, but they don't really have any of the authority. Um, you know, the, the people that they are working with, the ones actually creating the product, they don't report to them. They don't report to the product manager. So it's a really tricky role. So I don't know what, I mean, I suppose they're, in order for a competition like that to work, I think you need the people there that actually do create the products and while there are product people that do have technical backgrounds, um, that's not always the case. So I think that's why our minds have never gone there. But yeah, maybe there's a way to do that at some point. I'm, I always love interesting ideas. So maybe there is a solution to that. So I was thinking we could kind of go back to just like general, general business topics. And we have some questions on that. So I was going to start it off from Justin, he's a senior chemical engineering major, and he asked, what has been your biggest challenge when founding and working for companies that are in their early stages? I, the biggest challenge is, is just not knowing if you're on the right track, you know, like not knowing, like finding product market fit. Like we spent three and a half years or whatever it was at eFuneral and never really found product market fit. Now, part of that, I think, is we were maybe 10 years too early. Uh, Cause think about it. We started that business almost 10 years ago. And now there, there are some end of life companies that are, you know, like every year there's been more companies to come out, but even now there's not like one that like owns the market or, or that I would even say is like found great, great success. Um, so we never found product market fit with product collective. We found product market fit really early. 
Um, and so just being able to find product market fit, that's the biggest challenge. The, and a challenge to that is like, there's never a point in time where all of a sudden you get an email or a notification push notification that says, congratulations, you found product market fit. And you're like, Oh, cool. All right. I guess. We, so we're on that right track. Like it's, you, you know it when you feel it, you know, and, and, but it's like, if you haven't gotten to that point before, like, how do you know that you're there? So to me, that is the biggest, that's the biggest challenge, like getting to that point, but also figuring out like, are we even at this point? I, I like, I've heard some people say, if you ask yourself if you found product market fit and you're not sure of the answer, then that means you haven't found it yet. But it's still, it's, it's, um, it's, it's not so easy to know sometimes. Thanks. And I'm going to follow that up with another question. Um, this is from Lawrence Wright. He's a senior electrical engineering major focusing on electrical power systems. So his question is, were there any parallels between the industry and market that you learned at Findaway and the various startups that you've been involved in since? Uh, are there any parallels to it? I mean, I think it just, the, I don't know if this is answering the question, but like I, the biggest thing for, for Findaway, and actually, this leads me to a story like ver for very recently, like with find a way we, the whole business plan was built around selling to retailers, you know, borders, Barnes and Noble, Walmart. Um, and think about it. Borders doesn't even exist anymore. Like that store is shut down. Right. So, but if, if we had just said, no, we're just going steadfast with retailers and it's, it's like sales are down. It's how do we sell better at retailers only? Like if we just stayed tunnel vision and we not opened ourselves up to thinking about like, well, wait, our, maybe we built the solution that is solving a problem better for some other market like libraries, like schools. If we never asked ourselves that or really explored that, that company wouldn't have been around for, you know, like that company is still around and it's thriving actually because they found even they've continued to ask that question and have come up with so many more solutions, but it started with like very early saying like, well, are there other opportunities for us? Um, I'll tell you just this. So, like what I will say, something that's always stuck with me is every business that I've been in, I'm, I'm always trying to think of, I'm not trying to be so set on what our solution is. I'm trying to all, keep in mind, what is the problem that we're trying to solve for? And should we be thinking about this in a different way? Um, very recently, when I was in Ireland, you know, like all this COVID-19 thing is happening. It's scaring me because I'm, I'm worried, like, am I, I don't want to get my family sick. Like, I just want to be home with them. But also, what does this mean for our business? Like, is this like, are we, what's going to happen? Right. And I had a dream that I was meeting up with a men my closest mentor. He was the CEO of that company find a way in the very beginning. His name's Christopher. And in my dream, I was telling all this to Christopher. And I remember Christopher saying to me in my dream, Mike, listen, you just need to find the library market. Like, remember, it, find a way you found that library market and that helped change the course of the business. He's telling me this in my dream. Like, it's probably what he would have told me if I called him, but like, he was telling me this in my dream. And I woke up and I'm like, it was like so prophetic for me. I'm like, I, I need to find the library market for us. And so like these industry virtual workshops, like maybe this is the library market, you know, maybe this is a brand new product that again, 10 days ago didn't exist that, that might thrive for us now. Um, maybe not, maybe it's something else, but I think what, like what has stuck with me is like, I'm always trying to think of what is that, what is that library market, which I never thought of in that context until I had that dream. So it's pretty, and it's not like he's passed away or anything. Like he's with us still, but like, and I emailed him as soon as that happened. And I'm like, you gave me this advice in, in my dream. Thank you for that. Um, but it, yeah, like that's going to stick with me for a long time. That's funny. Um, it looks like we have time for a few more questions. So if anyone has any last minute questions uh, for Mike, please put them in the chat. Um, here's another question. It's from Sean. He's a senior in mechanical engineering. And he was curious what your thought process was when you decided to leave the, a well paying job at a fast growing company to start something mm. of your own. Yeah, I mean, that I think part of it is I like there were two things. One, I, I, I knew that at some point I was going to take that leap. Like I, in my, in my mind, I felt like I was an entrepreneur. I just did not have um, that opportunity yet to go off on my own. And so I'm thinking back to like my time at Findaway in particular, because at that point when I left, 
it was it was a good paying job. Like the company was on the upward trajectory. Um, but then I had that experience with my cousin and we just felt like somebody needed to solve this problem. We thought, why not us? And and the other thing for me, I was thinking of was like, this is my chance. Like this is this could be my big break. Like this. And if anything, you know, say we fail, I guess I could just try to go find another job. You know, like maybe maybe they'd take me back here. You know, would they like I'm trying to think of this to myself and. Like when I was trying to weigh it, I'm like, you know what? What's the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario is we do fail. But I know that if we were to fail, it would, we would have done it the right way. Like meaning, you know, I like we always felt really strongly that we should be upfront with our investors, with our employees. Like we wanted people to um, not feel like they weren't getting the full information. And so like as long as we did things on the up and up, failing, I just had to like believe in myself that like if we did fail, there would be an opportunity, you know, like there was still a little worry about that. Like, would there be some scarlet letter? Like people wouldn't want to hire somebody that's had a failed startup before. But um, luckily I found like that wasn't the case at all. I mean, like we weren't even, I wasn't even like when I took one day, like emailing a bunch of mentors and just people in the community, to let them know what was going on. Like I wasn't even finished that list of emails when I started getting soft offers, you know, like, Hey, like you could be great here. Like, why don't we go to lunch sometime soon? And, um, you know, but like when you're making that decision to leave a company, like that's not a given. So it's, it's, it is not an easy decision. It, it wasn't even an easy decision necessarily to leave the company that I was at to start product collective, you know, like we didn't, I, I did it differently in that I didn't leave uh, to go into product collective full time until we actually had one conference under our belt and we had enough belief that like there actually is a business here. Um, and we had some revenue coming in too, to be able to allow me to do that. But um, yeah, I mean, at, at some point though, you have to push yourself off the, the ledge, so to speak, and, and, and sort of take that leap. Great. Um, we just got this question coming in now. This is from Evan Cooper. He's a community guest and he says, He's enjoyed your excellent use of Zoom over the past couple of years, including a recent presentation where you used multiple tools to engage the audience. Could you share some best practices, including in-session polling? <laughs> well, yeah, and that's a familiar name. So, hey, Evan, uh, nice to connect with you. Um, there are some cool things. I mean, not just, like Zoom does have polling features. There's also, um, there's a cool company called Slido. We've had one of one of the uh, workshop facilitators we work with and a speaker at a conference. He he's his name's Gib Biddle. He's the former VP of product at Netflix. Um, he's awesome, but he also he loves integrating Slido into his presentations. And so, and I think there are some now uh, integrations between Slido and Zoom. But um, there's some like tools that you can use like that that work really well. Um, we don't even necessarily do a ton with polling, but like we do like to engage our audience um, when we're doing our live uh, videos. So we do, we call them industry interviews every Monday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, we talk with product leaders from around the world and they're free by the way. So if you went to productcollective.com or actually industryconference.com, either one of those and you'll see interviews and that will lead you up to um, interviews that we have coming up too. Evan, I don't know if that was a dig at me not being able to get my polls working. I kind of felt bad. <laughs> I, I felt bad about that, Michael. But no, um, Mike, Mike does some really cool stuff with, with polls that engage the audience, which, which I think is important in these times to be able to do that. Yeah. I'll get it working well, next time. Maybe, maybe I'll hire Mike as my intern to get my polling <laughs> intern. <laughs> um, well, we have some last few questions kind of about the coronavirus. I don't know if you could kind of give us your input on those. This is one from Greta Lazara. She's a sophomore chemical engineering major, and she was wondering how the current state has gone the way and maybe any of your future business strategies, if you're looking ahead. I, well, I, I can tell you, like, even if, so if we were to have this conference, like, now thinking of things like, how do we keep people as safe as possible at the conference? Like, I, in, in Europe, you wouldn't be able to turn a corner without having sanitizer available. But like, that was never the case with any of our past conferences. Um, even the food, the type of food that we offer, like, you know, sometimes you offer snacks and they're the kind where like you scoop, you know, popcorn into a bowl, but like think, thinking of things like that, like that's if you have an in-person conference, right? 
Um, it also, again, has forced us to innovate to think of how can we solve the problems that we're trying to solve for, add the value we're trying to add, um, but in a virtual way too, right? And we've done, like we've done things like our industry interviews, we've done I've done dozens of those in the past. Um, I call this a podcast called Rocket Ship FM. So like that's something we do from home too, but like how do, we, from a business standpoint, like how do you can, how do you translate that into a revenue generating thing for us? Like those are the types, I will say like no matter let's just say we, some miracle, you know, vaccine came around and like by the summer, like it's all gone. There's no worries. Like, I think it'd be a mistake for us to be like, oh, okay, well now back to normal, back to the way it always was. I think this is forcing us to think about our own business and just try to like, think about how can we continue to keep innovating and, and um, not be sole reliant on, on maybe one revenue stream, which for us is like a live event revenue stream. Like, are there other revenue streams that we can have sort of mitigate that risk a little bit. Um, you know, I never thought that there would be a time where, you know, you, you, like it's possible you can't have a live event. Right. But so, but now, you know, you, I guess it goes to show you like, no matter what kind of business you're in, what, if you're relying so much on one revenue stream, you know, that that's a big risk that you're taking, even if it seems like it might be safe. Yeah, definitely. Um, I have another question about the coronavirus, and this is from uh, Justo. He asks, what's a good referral strategy for products that help businesses during uh, COVID-19? You know, I think one thing is, like, there are a lot of other, there are communities out there, right? So, like, ours, that's an example of one community. Saster has a community. Product Hunt has a community. Like, there's all these out there. If you are working on a product that you think can help um, with COVID-19, whether it is anything, it's a diagnostic tool, it's something that's going to help people make more ventilators, spreading the word throughout those communities. Because what if, if you were to come on our Slack, for instance, there's 10,000 people that are subscribed to our Slack. They're not on there every day, but hundreds of people are on there every day. And so like, if you were to put the message out about that, that's going to hundreds of people that can then like, maybe one of those people knows somebody that like immediately can can uh, put you in touch with somebody else that you know can get you working on that right away so i would say spread the word to as many communities as, as you can and hopefully very quickly um you'll be able to get in touch with people that can make sure that whatever it is that you're working on can be put to put to use and uh professor goldberg just mentioned in the comment he said um to justo <laughs> Uh, maybe share a few words about what you're working on. Do you want to do you want him to talk about that now, or do you want to wait, Professor Goldberg? Hey, yeah, just do you want to just share a couple words? I know you were texting me just what you're working on. Uh, we can't hear you. Try it again. You're unmuted, but we can't hear you yet. You still? Okay. Uh, okay. All right. I mean, you still just post in the chat. I know you had sent me a link about what you were working on. You still always um, doing interesting social stuff um, in the community. Um, so with that, let me, um, Marissa, thank you so much for yeah, moderating um, for, for our folks in the community. Um, as you could probably appreciate, giving our students a chance to moderate sessions is something. It's a new. It's a new skill set, um, and uh, you did a great job, Marissa. Thank you so much for doing that. You know, thank you. Thank you. We have to do yeah, our fun chat, thank you, Marissa. Yeah. That <laughs> virtual applause, right? Um, and Mike, we so appreciate. Um, you know, you as I mentioned in the chat, somebody was mentioning about kind of the work that you do. I mean, literally, I had Mike as a guest speaker. Um, sort of telling the e-funeral story in, um, in a class and, um, you know, the, the, the storytelling and the connecting to students and also just being a great resource in the community. And I was really keen um, to get Mike on our, on our um, faculty bench, and he's been teaching a variety of classes, including a, a departmental seminar on product management, which I know is very well regarded by folks and um you know we appreciate it and i think some of these comments about where we are in the crisis i know a number of people are tuning in from the community into these kind of sessions because we're all sitting at home 
adapting to kind of this new world order. We were joking yesterday just about, I know your, your family of four is at home, kind of you and your wife working, kids trying to, you know, get them to not run in during your Zoom calls. And I think we're all adjusting to that. You know, any, any sort of final thoughts and comments kind of on this new world order? Because we might be in it for a while. I mean, I will say the one thing is like, it's a, like, I wish we weren't in it, obviously, like, but I'm trying to look for some of the positive and the positive is maybe it'll make us all more kind. You know, I think, you know, it, it used, probably was a time where, you know, you're worried about like, oh gosh, what if my, what if my, you know, child runs in a video call, like I, I should be professional or, or like even me, like right now, like I'm in my bedroom, because this is probably the best place for it to be relatively quiet. But usually I used to be like so concerned about the right background and the right setting. And it's like, I don't think people care, you know, like, I don't think people care if a, if a child's running in the background anymore, or if like, we're kind of all in, in that, we're all in this together, like in that respect. Um, and just like, yeah, so hopefully people could be more kind to each other. And, um, you know, yeah, we might be in this for a long time. But um, hopefully we could get, you know, maybe this will connect us more to our families more connect us more to, you know, people that that maybe we were taking for granted before. I have been probably taking a lot of situations for granted. I know I was taking, taking, um, you know, kind of lifestyle for granted. I could just go to the movies or go to dinner. And um, so the, this will be one of those sort of landmark times in our life where it's a reminder to, to not take those things for granted. No. Oh, great, great. I'll be way to end. Um, I did just share in the chat, um, and obviously the students will be back, but um, Lanham Napier, who um, is a former CEO of Rackspace, um, so someone with a lot of expertise in the cloud, kind of, they were, they were early on even sort of pre Amazon web services. And he's a, um, angel investor now in the, in based in Texas, he's going to join us, um, via zoom. Antonio is going to be our moderator. Um, and we have a number of events coming up. Some are on these Tuesday, Thursday, one o'clock with class. And then we have some other special events, including Sam Jadala who's a case board member, who's head of Apple's um, home division, home kind of internet of things products. So that should be really exciting. So stay tuned. Um, most of you know how to sort of hear about us on sort of web LinkedIn, but we're going to keep the events and going. I did at the very beginning of the chat, we are relaunching my beyond Silicon Valley course with a focus on um, sort of supporting entrepreneurs in the crisis. If you haven't had enough Mike Belsito, you can watch him in my MOOC. <laughs> Um, so he's featured in there during his e-funeral days. So there'll be a number of events that are, that are part of that. So stay safe, everybody. Um, enjoy for those who are in Cleveland. It's a beautiful sunny day. So go stretch your legs and, um, we will see you, um, back in our speaker series slash back in class next Tuesday. So have a wonderful weekend.